everybody. I'm BD Comrados, and welcome, welcome again, my friends, to the Ask BD Show. And I don't know about you, but there is absolutely no one that I know, friends, family, colleagues, that have not been feeling out of sort. And for many people, they've been feeling out of sort, and understandably so, for quite some time, particularly, particularly since March with the pandemic. I mean, when you when you think about it, we went about our lives in a pretty typically normal way and then all of a sudden all of a sudden things that we took for granted walking into stores going to restaurants socializing face to face with friends and family how everything has changed in such a relatively short short period of time and people ask me so Dee, you are a psychotherapist and a sex therapist and an author how has this affected you? Well, it would be really, really dishonest to say that none of this has had any impact on me whatsoever. You know, you walk around wearing the mask, and I was saying to my husband, Jim, regardless of how many different kinds of masks that I'm wearing, I still feel uncomfortable. I have difficulty breathing when I'm walking around town. The stores, all the stores, particularly on the Upper West Side here in New York City, all the stores that have closed down. I haven't seen a patient, a live patient, which I love to see my patients who would come to my office here in uh, New York City and East Hampton uh, face-to-face. So I, too, just like you, have not been immune from all of the different changes that we are all experiencing. And I was looking at statistics, of course, the COVID statistics, as we all do on on a day-to-day basis. And that graph, the graph looks pretty, pretty upsetting. There's been a real uptick uh, in the in the month of November. And regardless of what a lot of people might tell you, that it is really just a political maneuver on the part of the government to frighten us, the reality is, is that we do need to keep our social distancing going. We do need to wear masks and hopefully the... Um, the virus, the uh, the vaccine is going to be here sooner or later. And, of course, we're going to have to see the impact of that also. Uh, I've been reading different things and there are concerns about, about side effects so that we are really living in a very, very uncertain time. And, of course, there's been stress on, on, on relationships. People have lost their businesses, their jobs, the social Social isolation is just really, really over the top. Uh, homeschooling for parents. I cannot even imagine what it would be like to have a, a young child and you're trying to have a job. People who are lucky enough to have jobs that they have to really go to on a day-to-day basis and trying to figure out how am I supposed to go to work and at the same time homeschool my children. And, of course, that changes almost on a day-to-day basis as well. Uh, are the schools going to be open? Are the schools going to be closing? What proportion of the week am I going to have to keep my children at home? How am I going to manage to work to navigate my, my child care responsibilities? So, just I want you to know that if you are feeling as overwhelmed as most people are, that you are absolutely not alone. Uh, mental health help, uh, helplines are, are surging, and 52% of those now working remotely, maybe in the beginning, it was sort of fun. You didn't have to go anywhere. You didn't have to get dressed. You didn't have to do your makeup. But the fact is is that now people who are working from home are feeling more and more and more anxious and disconnected. Americans have doubled down on some of their worst habits to cope with the emotional stress related to the virus. Alcohol sales have jumped up with spirits up 75%. 
people are exercising less and, and eating more. And if you find yourself judging yourself or your emotions or your responses, remind yourself that your feelings are absolutely normal. And, you know, I was listening to uh, a rabbi. In fact, I'm going to be doing a four-part series, which you can all register for. It's free beginning tomorrow. And Rabbi Joshua Franklin, uh, who is the rabbi from the Jewish Center of the Hamptons, he was citing in one of his sermons, it was interesting, the, the serenity prayer. And it was a reminder. It was a reminder for me, and hopefully it is a reminder for all of you to grant yourselves the serenity to accept the things that we can not change. We cannot change our family background. We cannot change what's going on with the virus. But the courage to change the things that I can, that we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Because the reality is, is that there are a number of things that we can all do on a day-to-day basis that is going to actually help to improve the quality of our lives and the quality of our relationships. I mean, we can wake up every single morning, especially now that there isn't as much sunlight because we're now really moving into into the winter season. And we can say to ourselves, we have a choice. We can say, this is going to be a terrible day. It's raining outside. It is a dreary day. Uh, I don't want to get out of bed. Or what we can do, on the other hand, is we can say to ourselves, I'm really happy to to be alive today. What can I do today to make sure that my day is going to be as as good as it possibly can? Well, of course, we can eat well, as Dr. Gary Null, he tells us day in and day out, the plant-based diets, the fruits, the vegetables, the grains. We need to make sure also that we are interacting and we are socializing as much as we possibly can. Of course, these days, it's really on Skype and and Zoom and and on uh, the phone. But it's important. It's important. Even if you have short, short little conversations with people who you care about and people who care about you, that too can make all the difference in the world. And of course, making sure, making sure that you get enough sleep. And I have a number of articles, which we can go through uh, later on in the show today, about the studies and the importance, of course, of exercise and weight training. And not only are these things fabulous to tone our bodies and to keep us feeling physically, physically fit, but the emotional impact, the psychological impact of exercise and and weight training. I mean, it really goes a long, long way. So if you are someone who has said, well, I've never exercised. I don't like to exercise. I can't think about weight training. When we go through some of these studies and the results of these studies, hopefully you will give it a second thought and start to engage in an exercise program or a weight training program every single day. I know that for me, it makes all the difference in the world. And also, of course, the importance, and I talk about this every single week, the importance of having supportive people in our lives and making sure, making sure that we eliminate not only all the toxins, the chemical toxins in our lives and in our environment, but also to make sure, to make sure that we eliminate as best as we possibly can toxic people who make us crazy. And that, of course, oftentimes means friends and family. And I'm not suggesting that we don't try to work things out with difficult people, but if you're finding that your relationships are continually, continually in a down spiraling mode, you really have to ask yourself, is this the way 
that you want to spend your life? Is this the way that you want to spend your time with people who really, really disrespect you, who don't really care about you? Because it's all about, I think, in the final analysis, being aware of things that we can do. Not just thinking about them, but things that we can actually do on a day-to-day basis that are in our best interest. And that is the homework that I give my patients after every single session. It's the same homework for everybody, for people to be very, very mindful as we navigate our days. Are we living our lives? Are we doing things that are really good for us versus engaging in behaviors and having relationships with people that are destructive and self-destructive. And sometimes we get a little bit confused, but I think that the question is really an important question. And of course, things like dancing and and listening to music and, and herbal teas. And even more important, to find a reason for getting out of bed, to find a real purpose in life, regardless of your age or stage in life, something that is meaningful. And what I have found to be extraordinarily meaningful for me is helping others and and giving back. And when I think about it, you know, I have been in practice now for over 35 years. I have treated really hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of people from every single walk of life. And the gratefulness that I feel that I have been given the opportunity to be able to really give back and and help others. I know it has done a great, great deal for me. Sometimes I think that maybe I've gotten more out of the experience of helping others than people have gotten from me. But hopefully it has been a win-win situation for my my patients that I love and that I have treated over the years, um, you know, as well as uh, for myself. Well, if you happened to be listening to last week's show live, you know that I was talking about uh, what went on at St. Michael's Church here in New York City with Father George William Rutler. And he has been uh, accused, allegedly accused by Ashley Gonzalez. Uh, who is a 22-year-old young woman who worked as an overnight security guard at St. Michael's here in New York City. And uh, what happened during her shift? It was a a midnight shift. Uh, She obtained video and she recorded that she shows uh, Father Rutler watching pornography and masturbating on his computer. But that is not really the issue, okay? We can say that it was immoral and he was a father and he shouldn't have been doing this. But what ended up happening, and this is a quote, he looked at me, and this is according to Ashley, with a smile, looked away. and He put his hands inside his pants and he was playing with himself. She tried to leave the pastor's office, but he slammed the door shut And this is, again, a quote from Ashley. He aggressively threw himself on me and grabbed me sexually, aggressively, and I was fighting him off me, Gonzalez said, who added that she sent frantic texts to her mother begging for help because she didn't know what to do. Who did she call? Who did the family advise her to call in the middle of the night? Well, she called Black Ops private investigator Manuel Gomez, who is a private investigator extraordinaire, an activist, an author, a star of the award-winning documentary Crime Plus Punishment, which you absolutely, if you've not seen it, you have to see it. And Manuel recently devised a piece of legislation that would create a new state oversight. And we certainly need oversight of police department and district attorney's offices throughout New York. So 
So, Manuel, welcome, welcome again to the Ask BD Show. And I know that we are all, including me, because I know that you had a special call this morning with somebody, uh, to please give us an update on what is going on uh, in the uh, Father uh, Rutler case. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you, BD, uh, for having me on the show. And I'm sorry that I'm on a show of this egregious nature um but unfortunately you know uh this is what happens and you know i had to expose the uh corruption and injustice and this moral monster father william george rutler to give everyone an update um is uh right now um the F- father rutler will be coming into the district attorney's office sometime this week god willing should be arrested this week uh, with the charges placed on him. The reason why it's taken so long is because when the incident occurred, it took um, 12 days for the victim to get to the district attorney's office. So literally we had to wait in limbo for almost a little under two weeks before something to, to even begin to converse with her uh, regarding the uh, allegations. The police report was uh, done that night after having to argue with the 10th precinct for about an hour and a half to file a report. And this is the problem, you know, that many women throughout the United States face. Um, So many women are sexually assaulted daily. And I would dare say, if not almost half the women don't report it because they become victimized by the system or they don't report it for humiliation uh, reasons and and they don't feel that they get the help. And this is something that I unfortunately learned the hard way in this case. Um, I personally witnessed Ashley and myself having to fight for an hour and a half to file a police report. Um, even why though was that, now, Manuel? Why, why was that? I mean, after all, sexual uh, assault, sexual harassment is a, it's, it's, it's a crime. Why do you think that the police were so reluctant? Why do you think they gave you such a hard, hard time in the middle of the night when you were trying to, you know, have her give a statement? Well, well, the reason is, is, first of all, she showed up to the police precinct in her work uniform. And this is approximately around 2 o'clock in the morning, okay, at the 10th precinct. And the cops were standing outside, so they interviewed her in the street. Now, when a woman reports a sexual assault or a rape or attempted rape, but this was an attempted rape, just to make this crystal clear, he sexually assaulted, but his goal was to rape her. Okay. He grabbed her breast twice very hard. He pushed her shoulders down. He was pushing her down to the floor. He wasn't interviewing her. He was going to rape her. This is why he slammed that door shut. Okay. Ashley broke her nail fighting to get out of this room. Okay. So I want to make that clear to the public. You know? But regardless, um, she went to the precinct, and before she got there, she was on the phone, and I told her, hang up the phone. I'm on my way. Record. I want you to press record from the moment you get to that police precinct. And she recorded for one hour and 29 minutes, even to the point to when I got there. And they were, she kept telling him what was going on and what happened. And they literally wanted her to brush it aside because it was a priest. And I'll be honest with you, Beatty, if I did not hear the recording myself, I wouldn't believe it. I would not believe it. And now I'm such in shock. I am so flabbergasted to realize that, you know, what all these women have been saying is true. It is difficult for a woman to report a sexual assault crime. And now in this upcoming week, uh, in the next week or so, there's going to be a Times, New York Times article that they were working on already about how many women have a problem filing a sexual assault complaint with the Manhattan DA's office and that how many women's cases just fall to the curb. They just wash them underneath the, the bridge. And this is the bad thing. And and on this case, I want to share some good news for the public. Um, about a week and a half ago, I was so angry for the process taking so long. I sent my information showing the immoral, disgusting, sexual deviant behavior of, of priest George William Rutler. I sent it to the Vatican. I even sent it to the Pope's email. I sent it to the cardinals up there. I sent the videos to them showing what he's doing in the church rectory. And 
they took them off now the Eternal World Global Television Network, okay? Which this was a, a television show that pre, that the Father Rutler was preaching on weekly to hundreds of millions of people worldwide, okay? Right. And so he's off of that. They took down his website. They took him off of that. Um, and now I, then I sent it to the Archdiocese to Cardinal Dolan's office and to his uh, lawyers as well, and they have it. And so now he's been removed from his priestly duties. The sad thing is that, you know, priest uh, George William Rutler sent out a letter to all his parishioners stating that he has stepped down from his priestly duties. That's not correct. He was made to step down. He was ordered to step down because he has no business being with the parishioners, all right, and anybody in the Catholic Church because this guy is a sexual deviant. And the, and the sad thing about this, you know, do people watch pornography? Yes. Do people masturbate to book pornography? Absolutely. But this is not just pornography. This was gay, young male pornography of young men or young boys. We can't determine what it is yet, but when you look at the video, you'll see it's young guys, you know, performing sexual acts. And then you can hear Father Rutler saying, oh, yeah. I you something, Manuel. I mean, you, you are the, you know, private investigators extraordinaire. Do we know whether or not there have been other charges made, previous charges against uh, Father George William Rutler in the past? Do we know anything at all about his history in terms of alleged sexual abuse, sexual assaults? Uh, I mean, if anybody could find out, it would be it would be you. So, do we at this point know whether there were other women, whether there were other kids, whether there were other men who ever uh, filed complaints against him? Yes, um, and I thank you. That's yeah. a great question. Um, I I figured because of the way he was so open about it and, and aggressive, he had to have done this before, or some other woman had to have witnessed this. So yes, there is another woman um, who has he has seen him playing with himself and doing this stuff, um, and that person is also now being interviewed as we speak, and that was just recently found out about four days ago. So, yes, there is another woman out there. Um, I believe uh, once this story continues to go and spread further out, that more people will come out. Um, there is no doubt in my mind, uh, due to the comfort zone he has in doing this, that he's mm. done this before. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, professionally, you know, I can say that, but that he fits the bill and, you know, What's even more disturbing is, like I said before, he is out there aggressively trying to deny he's done anything wrong. And he's well, sending out letters to Perissa. Of course, of course, what he said in the letter, too, he said, after consultation, I have the letter here, after consultation with Cardinal Dolan, who has been supportive and for the good of the parish, I have willingly offered to step aside at this moment for my duty. So did Cardinal Dolan request uh, that he uh, take a leave of absence for uh, lack of a better way of, of expressing it at this point. Who well, no, I wouldn't down? say Cardinal Dolan requested. They they had to remove him um, because uh, Father George William Rutler's perversions um, is a threat to the Catholic Church and is a and is a liability to the church. So until this investigation is done, okay, he needs to be removed. So for that letter is is is, is nothing more than a lie. I, I know the Cardinal of New York would not stand back and leave him in the position of power running Saint Michael's Church and preaching to the to the parishioners if he was under investigation. No. You would have to move him for the safety of the church and that's what happened. So that was a lie in that letter. And secondly, Father Rutler didn't remove himself from the Eternal World Television Network. They took him down. They took down his website, took down everything. All right, they, they disassociated themselves with him. Because you see, the fact of the matter is, is this. The video of him jerking off to young guys committing gay porn and screaming, oh, yeah, in his office clearly shows this. 
shows his immoral behavior in the house of God. Now, well, that's, that's, a, that's true, but of course, you know, playing devil advocate here, and of course, I would <laughs> hardly be a supporter of uh, of any type of, of sexual abuse or sexual assault. I mean, somebody can, uh, you know, be into gay gay porn, etc. It's certainly not the place to be watching gay porn or porn of any kind um, in a church, but of course, that does not equal, you know, somebody having tried to sexually assault or not tried. I mean, he did sexually sexually assault her and she actually felt that uh he uh really that there was a good chance that he was going to rape her had she not been yeah. able to get away well i mean this what's even more disturbing about this case is that there's video cameras at the rectory so now uh-huh. because of all this time that's have elapsed things tend to t- all of a sudden disappear now really See what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Yes, uh-huh. And, and this, but thank God that as she was smart enough to record, she documented, she sent text messages out to her bosses a minute right after it. So if you look at the time of the video, the time of the text messages, everything is all, you know, one minute after the next. And and then she contacted, you know, MG Security. But again, MG Security, you know, failed Ashley. Uh, they Their first response to her was to tell her, hey, uh, you know, don't say anything. We can resolve this. Uh, we can, you know, don't tell anybody. You can just tell your mom. Don't tell nobody else. How do you tell a girl who is just violently sexually assaulted, don't tell the police, don't tell anyone? And that's mm-hmm. because this company has a history of doing that to the employees. MG Security has been sued three times for doing similar acts with other employees, and they had to pay and settle out of court each time with those employees. Now, this is public record. This is public record. People can look it up. And and, and it's sad. And you know how I found out about it? Because I wasn't investigating MG Security. How I found out about it was from the news reporter. He showed up to me during the interview with all the lawsuits in his hand. And my mouth hit the floor. I, I was so appalled. And I'm like, this is a former FBI agent owner, and he's Telling his employees, don't report it. You know, I mean, it's 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 so disgusting they because you know their, I'm a devout they didn't Catholic. Lose their contract. I, I mean, I would suspect that they probably had a very lucrative contract with the. No, they do. Uh, with the right? archdiocese. Yes. Yeah. They, yeah. They do. Well, I, and that I, was I the whole thing. I also wanted to update my audience and let them know that I received uh, in my personal email a very, very nasty email from from someone who was extremely upset that I had you, Manuel Gomez, on on my show. And I want people to understand that this, this whole issue with Ashley Gonzalez, this is not about Manuel Gomez. This is not about BD Conbretos. This is not about a show. This, this is not a soap opera. This is about a young 22 year old woman who was sexually abused, sexually harassed. She was very fortunate that she was not raped. And this is someone who I spent over an hour with and did a very in-depth diagnostic assessment. I mean, I have treated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of women and, and some men who were sexually abused as children, who were sexually assaulted as, as adults. And the fact of the matter is, is that diagnostically, Ashley was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, understandably so. She is understandably clinically depressed and also, of course, having a lot of anxiety. So this is not just a media hype program and i felt that it was and it is very important for people who are listening to the show and people who i didn't even dream manual who listen to the show but they really <laughs> understand that this is serious business and that i am not just a talk show host and you are not just a star of a movie and that we are not just looking for uh publicity that this is a serious situation that we as professionals 
have no intention whatsoever to walk away from until justice is gotten for uh, Ashley Gonzalez. And I agree with you, and I want to thank you for reiterating the fact that, you know, you as a therapist did a psychoanalysis of her, and then also, you know, uh, you were able to validate if she was saying the truth or not and, and what she went through. And now she's, you know, going to therapy for this, and, and you know, and I have some great news. Um, I've had the privilege and pleasure now of speaking with Attorney Gloria Allred's office, who now is now considering on taking the case on and uh, representing uh, Ashley and ensuring that this moral monster, which we call Priest George William Rutler, is removed from all priestly duties. We do not need any more predators and sexual pedophiles and, and sexual deviants in the church. Unfortunately, Beanie, no matter what religion we're in, there's always a, a, an apple uh, in the barrel, always. Except this time, this rotten apple wasn't at the bottom of the barrel. This rotten apple was at the top of the barrel, okay? And, you know, that's why I had to send all the stuff to the Vatican to show them, look, this guy who is the missionary of mercy appointed by the Pope is not a missionary of mercy, but he is a missionary of terror and horror. And then he's a knight of the sepulchre. He's not a knight because a real knight's words speak the truth and his actions defend the weak. He is taking advantage of a girl who weighed 110 pounds. Come on. But Ashley, on. Ashley, I mean, I can't even imagine how she had the instincts. I mean, she is an incredible young woman. I have not yet met her. And, of course, she is in therapy with somebody else. And that's a really, really important thing that she's doing all the things that she needs to do. But I can't even imagine how she had the great instincts, Manuel, to turn on the recorder and to be able well, to a story with that. have that as evidence to, to, to really just uh, support her uh, allegations. Brilliant. Well, <laughs> well, the reason why she knew, and it's because I knew Ashley four years ago on another case that I was working on. The, she was a friend of the family where I proved this other kid innocent. Actually, the kid, Pedro Hernandez, that's in the documentary that I'm in a crime and punishment, and she knew the family. So, you know, she saw how I worked, and I always told her, look, you know, you're a young lady, always record, you know, first thing. You never want it to be your word against theirs. It's always your video recording against their lie. And B, okay. this is how I win all my cases is because I, I video record everything. And because you know what? Then nobody can say you're lying. Nobody can say you did anything improper or you catch the crime on video. And this is, you know, you know, this is a very method and that I use throughout my everyday life as an investigator in New York. And Ashley was smart enough and astute enough at one twenty four, one twenty three in the morning to put down that device. And that's the thing that saved her. Because if she didn't have these recordings, right. it would have been her word against his. And that's too many times the case in our New York penal systems. Too many women, you know, report a crime of sexual assault, and it goes nowhere because it's her word against his. And, and it's sad how many predators get away with it. And But this time, I promise you, Beanie, I promise everyone out there, I am not going to stop until he is removed from my church. I am not going to stop until Ashley gets justice because, as I said before and I will always say, an attack on one woman is an attack on all women. Okay? No, Everybody's sure. got a daughter out there or a sister or a mother. They wouldn't want this to happen to them. No, exactly. Exactly. But I had some interesting news yesterday as I was preparing for the show. I happened to come across uh, mm -hmm. a, a man whose name is Deacon Greg Pandra. Now, apparently, I mean, he's been in the media forever. He is the creator of the Deacon's Bench. Now, of course, I knew nothing about him or I knew nothing about the Deacon's Bench, but he has 20 million followers all over the, uh, the world. And he had, he had the decency, truly, to report 
what happened to Ashley, and he reported the coverage that you were able to get for Ashley on uh, Channel 12. So here's a man very involved, a very, very big name in the World Catholic Church, and here it was uh, reported on the Deacon's bed. So, of course, what did I do, Manuel? I sent him an email. And... And I said, responsible, and of course, I offered him to uh, an opportunity to come on the show anytime. I have yet to hear I hope he does. So, the, yes, exactly. So, the word about this whole case is really starting. It's really starting to happen. And do you think that Gloria Allred is going to take the case? Well, um, well, first of all, I want to say it's looking like uh, her office will take the case. Um, wow. They've been in contact, so um, I'll know better today, um, but yes. Um, and then the other thing is that deacon that you uh, announced, I also emailed him and offered to send some more of the evidence of Ashley, you know, fighting outside to file this police report and how untrained, how disrespectful, how discourteous the NYPD was and is to, you know, this lady who came well-dressed, in, in uniform to a police station at 2 o'clock in the morning. I mean, how do you, you know, not help someone? And this is our problem. This is the systemic problem, especially Manhattan is vicious for this. Manhattan, had, this is why the Times is doing this big expose piece on the Manhattan District Attorney's Office because of all the women who have cases that reported sexual assault, and, and the majority of them, the Manhattan DA's office throws them out, doesn't even bother to process them. Do you know their philosophy is if you don't have a video, we're, we're not going to process it 90% of the time. And I didn't even know this. I'm being told this, and let me say that again. I'm being told this by the reporter for the Times. So why do, like, you, why do you think this, why do you think, or what do you think is actually going on at the DA's office where police men and I'm assuming women are responding in such a disgusting and irresponsible way? I mean, I, I, I don't quite understand. Somebody has, is alleging sexual assault, sexual abuse. You take a report, you look into it. I don't get it. I mean, do you think it's because uh, of the fact that in this case uh, it, it was a priest? But you're saying that across the board this has been their generalized response to women who are alleging rape, sexual assault, sexual abuse. Yes. And unfortunately, this has been the case. This has been the case, um, you know, that this system is failing the women. The system is not addressing these matters, and women are not being taken as seriously as they should be. And this is, you know, the Times is focusing on the Manhattan DA's office, but in my experience, I'm experiencing it on a statewide level. It's throughout the state, no matter where you go. And it's sad. And this is why we have to have, and as you said in the beginning, why I wrote that independent agency with Frank Serpico um, called the Department of Civilian Justice. And now we're going to be in Washington sometime in late February, March, um, to uh, be speaking in front of the Judiciary Committee to introduce this new agency that would bring oversight over the DA's office. So when cases like this, the Ashley's or the Jennifer's or the, or the Tina's, or the Horowitz, or the Gomez's, or the Gonzalez's, or the McEwen's can go there and get justice. Unfortunately, we don't have an AC like that now. And this is something I know a lot of people have seen the movie, I'm sure my age, but have seen the movie Serpico with Al Pacino, and Frank Serpico and I wrote this in the hope that we can provide a mechanism of transparency, justice for all. But now I've gotten a congressman who uh, who just got elected, who is now sponsoring the bill to be a national bill so we can have a national agency to ensure that every woman who is sexually assault, assaulted or any person who is uh, suffering injustice from the prosecutor's office or the judges or the police departments or the Department of Corrections can get justice. I mean, listen, I, just, to, just to step back a second, we just had a, the city of New York this year send out notices to 
all the people who went to visit people in Rikers Island for being sexually assaulted by correction officers. The city settled $11 million settlement to pay all these people $3,000 each for their assaults. Now, to me, I'm disgusted by that. You're going to pay somebody $3,000 for grabbing their vagina or grabbing their breasts or their genitals, and then mm-hmm. and you think that's okay? No, but this is what this is the system and the society that we're in now because this is what's going on. And everybody can look it up. I mean, you had the six female correction officers who were sexually assaulting hundreds of women. Manuel, I want to and ask you something. How does the New York DA's office and, and what's going on and what's not going on, how does it compare to other DA offices around the country with regard to uh, dealing with uh, women's alleged uh, sexual assault uh, statements and allegations. Okay. I'm how glad that you brought that up. The, re- the reason um, we have this systemic problem nationwide, New York City is the epicenter for the largest prosecutor's offices in the entire country the largest police department in the entire United States, okay? New York City has the largest police department and amount of prosecutors in one centralized area. So many states come here and copy the police procedures, the legal protocols, the procedures for the Manhattan DAs, Bronx DAs, Queens DAs, and this is why you see that same problem emulating in all these different states. Uh Again, this is the very fabric of why Frank Sepko and I came up with the Department of Civil Injustice because the problem has has gone nationwide. And now the corruption is so bad, but it's become sophisticated, BD. It's so good. It's so sophisticated now that they've got it to a science. And this is the problem, you know, and this is why I'm happy that, you know, you were able to assess Ashley Gonzalez, you were able to do, use your me, your professional medical skills and psychological skills that you learned as a professional to determine, you know, what happened and the, what she's suffering from. And I'm glad that you brought it out because, you know, because of your recommendation, BD, she's now getting counseling. And because of your analysis of what she suffered, it's already been confirmed with other therapists as well. So, you know... I'm glad to see her get help, but like I said again, I want two things to get justice here. One, I want Ashley Gonzalez to get justice. Two, I want the people of Manhattan to get justice because this sexual predator must not be in our church. And I also emailed that deacon, too, so thank you for that. Yeah, we're going to have to see if we hear, if you hear back or or if I hear back. I suspect neither of us will hear back, but uh, one one never knows. You know, the other thing that I, that I wonder, and of course, you know, my my (laughs) husband, Jim Meadows, has been a professor at John Jay for, for many, many years. I wonder about the training also of these police officers, whether or not they have been trained, I mean, with everything that's been going on over all these years just in the Catholic Church, I mean, one in three women before age 18 report having been sexually abused, sexually harassed in, in some fashion. So I'm kind of wondering what the professors, what the teachers who are teaching our, our, our policemen and women are doing in terms of uh, sexual abuse, sexual assault, rape education for our law enforcement officers. I am so curious. That's a great about- question. I can answer that. And that's a fantastic question. Um, and I'm going to answer that. Uh, and that is nothing. For police nothing. officers, they're not trained in how to deal with that type of situation. The only ones in the police department that would receive some type of uh, training for that would be the detectives from the Special Victims Unit or other detectives and precincts. But when it comes to a regular patrol police officer to be trained on that level of dealing with the rape victim and so forth and how to, you know, deal with the psychological damage that just occurred to them and how to handle them and talk to them and, and give them the proper courtesies and respect, 
Um, no, you're not trained in that. And you're not, they don't you're train not that. trained in stopping. You're doing the whole stop and frisk movement. I mean, so they're not trained in stop and frisk. And I understand that they're being a little, there's been a little bit more training. They're, you're saying that they're really not trained very well, if at all, in dealing with sexual assault allegations. So, I mean, our educational system, I mean, this is another layer that really needs to be looked at. I mean, what is it that's going on where our educators, where the teachers, where the professors are dropping the ball since we have such a serious, serious sexual assault, sexual uh, abuse situation in the United situation in the United States, where you have one in three women have been sexually assaulted or sexually abused before age 18. So I don't understand. I mean, maybe this is the Canadian girl in me, why it is that our educational institutions have dropped the ball. And it would be so interesting to talk to people who are actually teaching law enforcement officers and hear what they have to say. Well, I hope they'll they'll take the time to come on your show. But I do want to give uh, everybody some type of a level of hope uh, right now. Um, actually, she's going to be on a show called The Radical Imagination. Uh, uh, District Attorney uh, Diana Florence is going to be is running for the Manhattan District Attorney. And let me tell you something. She's a great district attorney. And me, it's public record that I have no love for them. But this district attorney I respect because she stands up to what's right and stands up for justice. And I feel that she'll be an asset to Manhattan. And she's definitely one that is known for you know, rocking the boat and going after the system. And I do believe that if she is elected, she will uh, bring changes. The other thing of hope that I have is that now that this new New York Times article that's coming out about uh, the numerous amount of women that don't get help from the police department, don't get help from the DA's office in Manhattan, um, is going to come out and will help the DA's office maybe reorganize re-look at their uh, training mechanisms and look at how they are prosecuting cases. Right now, we have a society beating based on 95% plea bargain, which uh-huh. means to the people who might not understand that, that means that 95% of the people, they offer them a deal rather than prosecute or go to trial. Or they try to scare you into taking a deal, which okay. you'll see in the film Crime and Punishment where the judge tries to scare this young boy, Pedro Hernandez, and right. taking a deal. Right, even though he was innocent and it's proven innocent. But the judge okay. still tried to manipulate him and the DA tried the Bronx DA to manipulate him to try to take a deal, uh, so he could go to school and get out of jail. And this kid could have walked out of that courtroom right there at that very moment when the judge was gonna because the judge told him on the record, You can walk out right now. You can walk out the door right now. The kid said no and went back to jail for another uh-huh. four months. Because he was innocent. Now, not many people have that kind of strength, that type of backbone to say no and go back into a realm of hell, which he was living in. And let me tell you something that in the movie doesn't show, and a lot of people don't know this. When Pedro Hernandez said no, two days later, there was an altercation at the prison, which he was not involved in. But they maced everybody in the cell block he was in. They did not let him wash his eyes for more than 12 hours. Pedro Mm -hmm. Hernandez lost 40% of his vision because he was not permitted to wash the mace out of his Mm -hmm. eyes. You know, Manuel, you know, know, wearing my psychotherapy hat, not my talk show hat, but my psychotherapy hat, you know, I'm asking myself right now, is that the kinds of people who go into law enforcement, I mean, is, is, is that something that we really need to take a much better look at and, and, and have all prospective candidates go through some heavy duty mental health checks? I mean, it, it just seems unbelievable that you have a system where people are not being educated properly, are dropping the ball, where the system seems to perpetuate, uh, uh, you know, police officers dropping the ball on cases like, like, like Ashley's case. I just, there's so many questions that just don't seem to really add up. I mean, law enforcement officers, 
they're not bad people, right? No, and they're not. No. What you're saying, uh, I mean, something what? is really amiss. Again, when you have a young woman, you know, going back to Ashley, coming into the, the station in the middle of the night, telling her story and having this kind of really, really poor response from law enforcement officers who are there to support us and to protect us. I, I don't understand whether it's the system, whether it's the individual, individuals, whether it's the combination, whether it's a lack of education. No, it's the system. I mean, it's a mess. I believe it's the system. Um, and I, you have to understand the problem with the district attorney's offices throughout the state and the problem with the police department throughout the state. And I'm going to tell you what it is because they both suffer for the same problem. You know what it is? What? To get along, you have to go along. Now, let me say that again so everybody can hear me clearly. To get along, you have to go along to what everybody else is doing. So if you buck the system and say, hey, you're doing something corrupt or unjust, you just destroyed your career. Right. If you're a right. DA, if you're a district attorney, or if you're a, a police officer. And this is the problem. And this is why Frank Serpico and the movie Serpico said we have to have that independent agency, independent agency so that cops can report the corruption. Right now, we have cops that are afraid to speak out because right. they're going to lose their job. And I'm going to prove to you that with the Ashley Gonzalez case. During that one hour and 29-minute audio recording that we have, video of the police, there's a female cop in there. And so what did she have even to say? she, what did she, do? <laughs> she finally was the one that was ordered to take the report after an hour and 29 minutes. Finally, she took it. But then she's involved in it as well. So there's another female discriminating females. And again, that's like I said to you about the Department of Correction officers, the females that were sexually assaulting females, you know, and, and this is what is the problem, you know, you have good officers out there, but they're scared to speak up because they will lose their job, they will lose their security, they'll be transferred, and they'll be ostracized by the department. And this is something you saw in the movie with Serpico. Yes, for him yes. Speaking out. And it's the same thing in the Pedro Hernandez crime and punishment movie. You see all the cops that are ostracized and punished for speaking up against the injustice. Well, the NYPD 12, that's why I helped form them. Actually, I was the first one, all right, and then caused that class action lawsuit, you know, to happen against the city. And again, you know what? No matter how many lawsuits we have, right, uh -huh. and how many hundreds of millions of dollars the city pays, you know, I want to tell you something, B. I'm not sure if you know this. Do you know how much money the city paid a year ago for lawsuits for corrupt prosecutors, for no. cases like Ashley, and for cases like Pedro Hernandez? $200 million My. in one year. Wow. Now, that's, that's $200 million, and that's not New York State. That was New York City. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is and everybody. This is public record. You can go online and see how much money the New York City Council of Safety uh, Committee releases this budgetly quarterly, and you guys can look it up. Everyone can Google these facts, and they spent over two hundred million dollars spending on lawsuits for corruption. And what have we spent to change the problem? Nothing. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. We have done nothing. And this is something that happens yearly. Why do the taxpayers of Manhattan? have to pay such high property taxes. Why? Because we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars. The money we spent in four years on prosecutorial misconduct cases and police corruption, we could give every homeless person a co-op or a condo. That's mm -hmm. how much money we spend. We could send every kid in New York City to college for free for four years of money we spent. And this is the problem. You know, and, and BD, I'm really hoping that everyone, I'm not trying to bring you all down, but I want you to know there is a New York Times article coming out, um, the Department of Civil and Justice Bill. If you go on my site, Black Ops Private Investigators, you can download right. a copy of the bill. Me and Serpico will be in Washington. I'm also going to be inviting uh, BD to come down as well, and give her a female perspective on it as well, if she says yes, and things are better um, medically for everybody with the COVID virus. Um, but again, you know, I just want to say um, I think 
that if this new Manhattan District Attorney, Diana Florence, gets in, we might see a serious change within the Manhattan DA's office. And I'm really looking forward to it. I read online she's going to be on the Radical Imagination show uh, yes. this week. So if everybody can, you know, watch that. Um, but, again, um, you know, Diana Florence, I think, will bring some changes in hand. The only problem I have, B, is that's only Manhattan. We still need to change Staten Island, the Bronx, you know, just, Queens. Just before we Brooklyn. wind down, because I can't even believe that it's, that it's 355. I have in front of me an article uh, that was yep. dated November the 13th, 2020. <coughs> Pope Francis vows to end sexual abuse after the McCarrick Report. So this is from yeah. Rome. Pope Francis pledged Wednesday to rid the Catholic Church of sexual abuse and offered prayers to victims. They're going to need a lot more than prayers. The former Cardinal Theodore uh, McCarrick. The Vatican report blamed a host of bishops, cardinals, and popes for downplaying and dismissing mountains of evidence. Of course, this is against uh, McCarrick. So hopefully you are going to hear something very soon from the Vatican manual. <laughs> and, well, I, I think uh, so. I sent them so many serious, videos. That he's going to be serious about what he is saying, not just about McCarrick, but about these kinds of situations through uh, throughout the world. Listen, we're going to have to stop. Our time is up. It's wonderful talking with you and getting your perspective as always. And we'll talk soon, and you'll keep us posted. Okay, Manuel? I will. I'll let you know if once you get arrested and everybody out there, God bless you, Biddy. Thank you. And uh, everyone else out there, stay safe. And uh, may you all stay safe at night. God bless you all. Absolutely. Well, that was Manuel Gomez, the private investigator extraordinaire who's dealing now with the Ashley uh, Gonzalez case. Well, everybody, uh, I don't know where this hour has, has come and gone, but I think that it's really, really important that we update you about this. And by the way, uh, perpetrators deny uh, alleged sexual abuse, sexual assault, rape. I mean, that is the norm. That is a very, very common, common phenomenon. So it's going to be really interesting what's going to be happening with the DA oversight. It's going to be interesting to see what's going to be happening, uh, with, um, with, with Father Rutler. And uh, we have, there's a lot of work to do in our society, whether we're talking about racism or income inequality or whether we're talking about police oversight. And um, I think we all need to take a really big breath and uh, try and do whatever it is that, that we can do that's in our best interest, that's in the best interest of our society. And, of course, I leave you with my most favorite, my most favorite music, and that is what the world needs now is love, sweet love. We have to do a much, much better job in taking care of ourselves and also in caring and in taking care of people in our society and around the world. So uh, I wish you, after a very heavy interview, we got another heavy interview, um, a really good rest of the day, and I will talk with you uh, next week. So be well, take care, keep your social distance, wear your mask, and uh, we'll talk next week. Goodbye, everybody.